Excellent. Let us begin. Welcome, everyone, to the reviews of the Enoch Seminar's presentation of Dr. Megan R. Henning's Hell Hath No Fury, Gender, Disability, and the Invention of Damned Bodies in Early Christian Literature. My name is Joshua Scott, and I'm the interim chief editor of RES. RES is the quarterly review journal of the Enoch Seminar. We strive to offer timely reviews of new works relating to Jewish, Christian, and Islamic origins. On behalf of the Enoch Seminar, Yale University Press, and our partner organizations, thank you for joining us today. This new volume, uh, in this new volume, Dr. Henning illuminates how the bodies that populate hell in early Christian literature, largely those of women, enslaved persons, and individuals with disabilities, are punished after death in spaces that mirror real carceral spaces that effectually criminalize those bodies on earth. Henning places early Christian apocalypses in relation to a wide variety of Greek, Hebrew, and Latin texts to explore the literary uses of hell's heterotopia. She cogently remarks that, quote, for early Christian thinkers, the courtroom, torture, the prison, incarceration, exile, and hell, all offered opportunities for education, spiritual reflection, and penance." End quote. This research offers a needed intervention in early Christian scholarship that centers gender and body studies. Today's two-hour event will begin with a brief introduction to Hell Hath No Fury by Dr. Henning. We'll then welcome four reviewers to review this work. Christy Cobb, Sarah Porter, Peter Mena, and Sonia Anderson. After the reviews, we'll take a short stretch break and then return for open discussion among all participants. We'll conclude our session with a brief expression of thanks and welcome from the director of the Enoch Center, Dr. Gabriele Bocaccini, who will be joining us shortly. We've imagined this event as a seminar with an atmosphere of collegial dialogue. And so we invite attendees to participate by means of the chat function in Zoom. In addition, we also invite you to use the raised hand function during the open discussion portions of the event to indicate you would like to join in the conversation and we'll call on you as time allows. We celebrate that we are joined today with people from around the globe for whom English may not be their first or even second language. To be as accessible as possible, I encourage all participants to speak slowly so the automated transcription service, as flawed as it may be, might communicate your speech. With those brief words about the format of our event, I now welcome Dr. Megan Henning for an introduction to her monograph. Megan, the floor is yours. Thank you so much for that lovely introduction. And thank you so much to the Enoch Seminar and Dr. Scott for organizing this event and publicizing it. And to the wonderful reviewers for reading the book and taking up part of your summer to participate in this panel. After an academic year that has left many of us totally burned out, I do not take this lightly. And I am tremendously honored that each of you were willing to take up this task. Um, so special thanks um, to Sonia, to Peter, to Sarah, and to Christy. Um, I also want to thank uh, John Collins, Jennifer Banks, Abby Storch, and the entire staff at YUP for expertly seeing this project from start to finish. Um, I cannot say thank you enough to Candida Moss for all that she has contributed from introducing me to disability studies theory all those years ago, to reading and commenting on multiple drafts of this book, to picking me up off of the ground, when in the midst of a global pandemic with no childcare, I thought that this project would truly never come to fruition. So um, whatever the shortcomings of this book are, they are my responsibility, but I also acknowledge that it never would be a book without um, a huge village of folks that um, encouraged and saw me through along the way. So I'm really delighted to get to share a brief overview of the book for those here who haven't read it. And I'm going to start by sharing with you the different threads that I'm bringing together with this project and specifically some of the ways that bringing those threads together 
has illuminated new pathways for me. Here, I would also like to offer a brief content warning to folks. Um, my presentation will not be very graphic, but given the nature of the subject, the book, and possibly this conversation will involve frank discussions of violence and specifically gender-based violence. In this project, I bring interests in ancient rhetoric, gender, disability, and ancient medicine together with my study of the early Christian apocalypses. I'm attempting to, do, to also do this for a broad audience so that hopefully undergraduates, for instance, could read this book and see the relevance of the study of early Christian history and specifically a bunch of apocalypses that they have probably never heard of. Simultaneously though, I am trying to treat sources that span centuries and a wide geographic range with nuance and care and offer new insights for specialists. I'm gonna begin um, first with my interest in rhetoric, which is one of the threads that I'm pulling at here. My interest in ancient rhetoric and my earlier work on the pedagogical function of hell in antiquity means that I came to this project interested in studying hell more as a beginning and not as an end. I'm interested not only in hell, but how we make hell on earth. That is, what are ancient authors doing when they make hell? What are we doing when we talk about it? As performances of visual rhetoric, these depictions of hell drew upon imagery that was familiar to the ancient audience in order to effectively stimulate the imagination. This book expands that line of inquiry further, interrogating how this rhetoric used, changed, or amplified bodily imagery to describe hell. I'm reading against, in that way, the earliest or early 20th century scholarship, which situated apocalypses as imaginary or as banal popular literature, and arguing that these texts were seen as both imaginary and real. And I'm doing so alongside folks like Adela Collins, Greg Carey, Tina Pippin, Jackie Hidalgo, Annette Yoshiko Reed, Lynn Huber, Maira Kensky, and Sarah Emanuel. Uh, however, that earliest 20th century scholarship has still had a huge echo effect on the way that the academic study of early Christianity has treated these texts for the last century. With respect to gender, um, I'm focusing specifically on the bodies of the damned. Since the bodies of the damned and the righteous play such a central role in the early Christian tours of hell, this work builds upon previous scholarship on the body and early Christianity. This scholarship has demonstrated that bodies were an important site for crafting identity. In particular, scholarship on early Christian enslavement, martyrdom, sexuality, and asceticism has shown that gender and bodily suffering play an important role in early Christian history. Here I'm thinking of the work of Peter Brown, Virginia Burris, David Brackey, Ben Dunning, Elizabeth Castelli, Stephanie Cobb, Bert Harrell, Bernadette Bruton, and Candida Moss, just to name a few. While this work builds upon Judith Perkins's connection between bodily suffering and identity formation, my focus on punitive suffering also challenges the notion that bodily suffering and subjectivity were always integrally linked for early Christians. Damned bodies reveal that the suffering self could quickly shift from subject to object. This project also required that I respect the tensions that are present when multiple ways of talking about gender or the body occur within the same text, rather than forcing a text to fit within a single discursive framework. I've avoided imposing a single theoretical model of gender and antiquity upon the texts under consideration. I thereby veer away from the allure of Thomas Lecure's one sex model, which has had enormous explanatory power for students of the New Testament and early Christianity in the last two decades. And here I instead follow the critiques of Helen King and Rebecca Fleming. Namely, we see through deeper readings of Galen and the Hippocratic Corpus that the female body is not just an incomplete male in antiquity, but is a radically different inferior body, one that was prone to sickness and flux because of constant changes to blood flow and internal balance. Thus in antiquity, inhabiting a female body is in many cases itself a disability. Looking at the bodily imagery of hell necessitated engagement with gender in three specific ways. 
First, this model of eternal punishment uses bodily difference and ancient concepts of gender and disability as prominent ways of sorting the bodies of the righteous and the unrighteous in the afterlife. Second, sin itself is defined and policed according to shifting gendered and hierarchical notions of the household, which is the subject of chapter two of the book. And then third, there are places where bodies in hell that have the potential to be valued as weak, compromised, and disabled, instead reveal the plasticity of the standards of bodily normativity by performing as models of efficacious bodily suffering. In particular, the tears of the saints and the figure of Mary queer the notions of the dissensus, assigning redemptive potential to effeminate bodies. These bodies still perform an ancient notion of bodily difference as bodily suffering, but they stretch the mold, which could confine that body to insignificant social roles. As Julia Watts Belsler has argued with respect to rabbinic tales of destruction, they flip the script and become potential sites of resistance. So that is one way that I engage disability in the book. But I should back up a little and say more. Disability might seem like a strange analytical category to apply to the bodies of the damned in hell, not least of all because there are impulses within disability studies and ancient history to look at antiquity as a time when things were better for people with disabilities. And in some situations, they were. While it was true that the disabled body wasn't always stigmatized in antiquity, it was still stigmatized a great deal more than you would expect in a population where the disabled body was inhabited by the majority of the population. Like the scholars who did the foundational work on disability in the Bible, Rebecca Raphael, Jeremy Skipper, Candida Moss, and Hector Avalos, I am working from the cultural model of disability, a post-structural response to the social model in which disability is both real and culturally defined. Relying upon the cultural model, disability studies theorists have cast disability in the contemporary world as a big tent that includes any bodily difference that impacts the way a person lives. Although the category of disability itself did not exist in antiquity, ancient sources assume a narrowly defined understanding of the normal body that regulates the bodies that deviate from this more norm, sorry, that relegates the bodies that deviate from this norm to a stigmatized and excluded existence, although it also regulates the bodies <laughs> in the society as well. I look to ancient medical texts and other ancient literature that describes bodily states similar to those that we find in hell, allowing ancient cultural norms to determine how ancient bodies were categorized and understood. Beyond the social stigma that we can discern in our ancient sources, the interpretive value of these non-normative bodies becomes increasingly obvious as we turn to the bodies of the damned in hell. In the Tours of Hell, I argue, a theology of bodily and spiritual impairment emerges in the early Christian apocalypses, in which the tortured body is a marker of spiritual ignorance and ethical failure, and salvation is described in terms of bodily perfection. In this way, the early Christian apocalypses heighten the ancient physiognomic consciousness that correlated physical appearance to ethical behavior. As anyone who has perused the first couple pages of this book can attest, this book is both about the early Christian apocalypses that contain tours of hell, but also not in any way limited to that set of texts. I include depictions of hell that are in Marian Dormition narratives, church mothers and fathers, and dissensus traditions. And as I do so, I hope to show that some of these texts should be read alongside each other, even if our genre distinctions and our ideas about what types of sources are historically important have prevented us from doing so in the past. My questions, which are both diachronic and synchronic, build upon the previous scholarship of Himmelfar, Bremer, Balcom, Nicholas, and others who have worked to trace the literary and historical relationships between these texts. Previous scholarship on the tours of hell has acknowledged the connection between violence done to bodies in the text and torture in the world and attempted to shift the cultural burden for this content in a search for its origins. By contrast, I analyze the content 
of early Christian depictions of hell in order to explain how the bodies of early Christian hell constructed and reconfigured the bodies of those who heard and read these stories. As I trace changes in the apocalyptic tradition of the tour of hell, I am not only looking at shifting literary traditions, but at, a sh at shifting sociocultural ways of reading the body and the afterlife. Perhaps one of the most notable shifts is the way that the bodies of the damned in early Christian hell amplify and intensify earlier ideas about the body by layering them with carceral imagery. The effeminate and disabled bodies in hell not only offer warnings to earthly bodies, they also reconstruct and intensify the stakes of bodily normativity, criminalizing the real bodies of women and people with disabilities. The punishments of early Christian hell not only mirror the bodies of the disabled in the real world, but they also intensify and reinforce the ancient idea that bodily difference was a punishment for sin. The disabled bodies mirror the carceral bodies of people in the Roman Empire who were punished for crimes. The spaces of hell are topographically analogous to the ancient mines, underground spaces of punishment that were filled with fumes. The damnatio ad metallum, or condemnation to the mines sentence, was among the harshest penalties in Roman law and was ordinarily reserved for members of the lower classes and enslaved persons. Late ancient Christian tours of hell use the space and conditions of the mines to imagine hell. And when they do this, they lower the status of those elites whose punishments bring them there. In ancient judicial nightmares, punishments included imprisonment, hanging, beheading, being thrown to wild beasts, crucifixion, or burning alive. Hell has all of these except crucifixion. This overlap between hell's punishments and the carceral bodies and spaces of the ancient world add a layer of criminality to the characterization of the disabled and female bodies that we find there. By the fifth century, the Theodosian Code brought the hellscapes of the early Christian apocalypses to earth. In this Christian compilation of Roman law, a nurse who mishandles her charge has boiling lava poured down her throat and the passive partner in a homoerotic coupling suffers burning by avenging flames, amputating of his hands and feet and glossectomy, surgical removal of the tongue. The breast milk beasts were not the distant threat of some faraway place in hell. In these punishments, as in early Christian apocalypses, the effeminate and disabled body is on display as the sign of moral, social, and spiritual failing. Through Christian laws, hell's womb birthed her inhabitants and their promise of bodily compromise is returned to earth. The damned body was not simply a mirror for ancient ideas about the body or retributive logic. Rather, the body in early Christian visions of hell both reflects and constructs lived reality. The permeable barrier between this life and the afterlife allows these images of tormented and deviant bodies to act as both mirror and blueprint. Hell's punishments for evil also construct evil. The body that threatens in hell becomes the threatening body on earth. That the punishments of early Christian hell were once again codified into religious law codes offers us a cautionary tale. Any society's bodily norms can be weaponized against the bodies that inhabit that society. And I am proposing that we think carefully about how to stop bringing these hells to earth. Excellent, thank you very much for that introduction. We'll now turn to our reviewers. Christy Cobb will start us off. Christy, the floor is yours. But hell is not a distant heterotopia. This sentence is a part of the epilogue to Henning's brilliant and provocative book, Hell Hath No Fury. The epilogue weaves together a number of strands present throughout the text, one of which is that imaginary bodies are linked to real bodies and discussions of ancient bodies are connected to understandings of bodies in our contemporary world. While early Christian apocalyptic texts take the reader on fictional tours of hell filled with bodies being tortured as a result of an individual's behavior, real bodies in antiquity were also suffering. 
Henning carefully outlines the ways in which ancient writers and modern scholars have understood the lines between real and imaginary and the division between these two categories. She argues, the damned body was not simply a mirror for ancient ideas about the body or retributive logic. Rather, the body in early Christian visions of hell both reflects and constructs lived reality. In my opinion, this theoretical reframing further scholarship in an extremely beneficial way, not only concerning texts that address hell, gender, or disability, but also more broadly in New Testament and early Christian studies. As Henning notes, the bodies of the damned actually resemble the real bodies of women and people with disabilities in their midst. This is true not only in the tours of hell, but also in other forms of ancient fiction. And it's especially important when discussing the bodies of women, persons with disabilities and enslaved persons, all of which are so often overlooked and or misrepresented, both within ancient texts and current scholarship. For example, Henning turns to the Apocalypse of Peter in chapter two, which includes a description of hell where sinners within match the gendered hierarchy of the New Testament household codes. The household codes begin with the relationship between the husband and wife, and this hierarchical relationship was one that directly affected views about marriage and sex. In the Apocalypse of Peter, chapters 7 through 10, both men and women are punished who do not follow this hierarchy and who deviate from their roles. Women who commit adultery, for example, are hung by their hair because, as the text assumes, their braided hair lured men into the adulterous relationship. In the Apocalypse of Peter, both men and women who commit adultery are punished, yet women are tortured more than men for the same sin. As Henning surmises, this mirrors ancient reality as it reinforced a Roman system of morality, which similarly punished women more than men for crimes such as adultery. In the hell described in the Apocalypse of Peter, Members of the household who are disobedient or who do not stay within their defined spaces in the family are punished. Just as a husband and wife are punished for adultery or other sexual sins, children are also tortured for not obeying their parents. Enslaved persons are punished for not obeying or following the orders given by their enslavers. These scenes in the imaginary hell, as Henning argues, are crafted to incite fear and enforce the boundaries created by the household codes. While the tour of hell is imaginary, the feelings it conjured for readers, both then and now, are very real. When leaving this tour of hell, devoted Christian readers might consider the consequences for pushing against the hierarchical boundaries of their household. This example is furthered when one considers the consequences to a couple who chooses to have an abortion in order to conceal adultery. While both parties are punished for the adultery and for infanticide, in the case of abortion, it is only the woman who is punished in the apocalypse of Peter. However, as Henning notes in the apocalypse of Paul, men are also punished for abortions that are had in order to, have, to hide adultery. In many texts, both early Christian and Roman, abortions are associated with adultery, and abortions were criticized even though they were officially legal in the first and second centuries. Not only are these imaginary female bodies connected to real bodies in antiquity, but the repercussions of these texts bleed into our contemporary discourse. Henning writes, the sediment of hell's logic is much nearer present in the ways that we conceive social responsibilities, justice, and bodies. In the epilogue, Henning provides numerous examples which are terrifying as we consider the ways in which female bodies are punished, both inside and outside our legal system. Further, disabled bodies are continually erased in the discourse, especially, as Henning notes, during the current pandemic. When I reread this epilogue in preparation for today's panel, the relevance and importance of Henning's work seem to double as we are on the heels of the overturning of Roe versus Wade. 
Now, to add to Henning's narration of examples of the ways that early Christian depict descriptions of hell are found in our current context, we can unfortunately add the experiences of many women in states where abortion is now prohibited. For example, an article published in May by the Associated Press tells the story about an abortion clinic in Tuscaloosa, Alabama, a half a mile from the University of Alabama's campus. Ramona, the nurse who is in charge of the recovery room at the clinic, is a Christian and sees her work as a calling to love and care for women after their surgery. She has interacted with pro-life protesters outside the clinic on several occasions, trying to talk to them about faith and scripture. Yet the protesters continue to yell at Ramona and the other women who enter into the clinic. Regularly, the pro-life protesters tell Ramona and the other women they are going to hell. As of June 24th, the clinic has been forced to stop all abortions and cancel appointments for over 100 pregnant persons. Just as women who had abortions were punished in the early Christian hell tours, as Henning carefully shows, we are teetering on the edge of similar punishments being, being enacted here in the United States. In fact, some of these punishments are already being enacted in fictional form hosted by evangelical churches. Henning describes these hell houses in the opening of chapter two, where modern evangelical churches take participants through imaginary tours of hell that are eerily similar to those found in the early Christian apocalyptic texts. Growing up in the rural South, I have experienced too many of these hell tours and abortion scenes are regularly featured. As Kelly Baker's article in Sacred Matters points out, these houses are, quote, premised on the basic evangelical arc of purity, its corruption, and then either a dramatic redemption or terrible condemnation. Similarly, the early Christian hell tours that Henning describes are also based on constructions of purity and the repercussions of deviating from the moral code created by society and reinforced by these texts. Women are continually punished the harshest, both on earth and in hell, and deviations from sexual expectations of chastity and purity result in torture. In the minds of these early Christian writers, and perhaps in the minds of the evangelical Christian producers of the modern hell houses, abortion is linked to sexual sin, such as adultery or sex outside, outside of marriage. But hell is not a distant heterotopia. From the apocalypse of Peter to contemporary hell houses, the imaginary and reality collide. While Henning's last line of hell hath no fury hopes to avoid bringing hell to earth, the recent overturning of Roe versus Wade draws the imaginary and reality even closer still, especially in the growing number of states where abortion is now illegal. Henning is right. Hell is not a distant heterotopia, and this affects marginalized persons the most. Thank you. Christy, thank you very much for your comments. We'll now turn to Sarah Porter. Sarah, the floor is yours. Hi, um, thanks Christy so much for that response. And thanks Megan for this book and to all the panelists for being here. I am really happy to be here too. Why is it so important for some Christians that hell be somewhere? In theologian Laurel Schneider is beyond monotheism. She suggests that hell is heaven's closet. Taking up Dante's Inferno as a Christian theological text, she describes the scene of hell's inner circle. A gigantic Satan stands frozen in a lake, motionless except for his steadily beating wings. To get to paradise, Dante and Virgil must draw near, uncomfortably near. After scrambling across the heads and faces of the frozen damned to the mired torso of Satan himself, Schneider says, Virgil leads Dante literally down the chest and thigh of the giant body of the monstrous angel in order to climb up at the groin into heaven. And from Dante himself, 
When he had reached the lower mezzanine of where the hip meets upper thigh, my guide, performing a most difficult routine, head over heels revolved, then occupied himself in starting to ascend the hair, hellbent, it seemed to me, on going hell's side. That's Kieran Carson's really lovely translation. Dante finds himself looking, quote, beyond a rounded opening of store on store of things of heavenly delight. Here is no majestic imposing gate as at the beginning of the inferno, but a rectum. And this rectum is in its own way, a grave, the one quite different from Bersani's, an entryway to the eternal rest of paradise. To call hell heaven's closet is for Schneider to say that it contains all the deviants that heaven can't abide, yet without which heaven couldn't exist. I found myself thinking of Schneider's infernal reading as I took Megan Henning's tour of hell's damned bodies. Intimate, bodily, sometimes unpleasant, sometimes graphic. Does this spatialized and somatic reading resonate with Henning's understanding of damned bodies? I want to consider this particularly through two of Henning's spatializations of hell, the hell house and the museum. How do these differ from the closet? And given Henning's note in her introduction that these narratives were part of a quote, early Christian paideia meant to move hearers to behave according to a particular ethical rubric, end quote, what and how do Henning's hellscapes teach? Henning's damned bodies are inscribed with the value systems of their writers. Sinning bodies are confined to hell and experience tortures appropriate to their transgressions according to the ancient principle of Lex Talionis. Along the way, these bodies become incarcerated, enslaved, ill, and feminized. This lens allows Henning to demonstrate quite effectively the way discourses of leaky, penetrated, confined bodies operated in antiquity in general, and for early Christians in particular. And even as the stories of hellish bodies evince the value systems of the late Roman world, they reinscribe them. Actual disabled, feminine, or incarcerated bodies become reminders of hell on earth. Thinking of Henning's apocalypses as, in Phyllis Tribble's words, texts of terror, demands further thought around affect, ailment and disability, and objection. Affect theorists such as Sarah Ahmed have noted the way certain bodies are taught as fearsome, disgusting, or grotesque in ways that stir up directional affects. I want to go away, or I am drawn in to gawk. That is, affect is always already bodily and spatial. On one hand, these images of suffering bodies can feel erotic and even sadistic. Particularly feminine suffering activates a feeling of titillation in the viewer or hearer. It is this aspect I will consider through the lens of the heterotopic museum in a few moments, that feeling of being drawn in to observe the spectacle, still always from a safe distance. But on the other hand, from the lens of the hell house, these images of suffering bodies can feel threatening in a way that makes the hearer want to go away. By putting specific body parts, the breast, the tongue, the eye, at center stage, the viewer or hearer must work hard not to imagine her own breast, tongue, or eye at risk or in pain. Similar to Paige Dubois' reminder that any enslaved body reminds a free person of what could happen to her, the hellbound body reminds Christians that security, in Greek soteria, safety and salvation, is precarious. This persists. Henning demonstrates how early Christian hellscapes were resolutely late Roman, which later casts a Roman tone onto the contemporary imaginary in forms of hell houses and even media like Orange is the New Black. In the introduction to chapter two, Henning notes how even in today's hell houses in the Southern US, the Punisher is seen as masculine while the transgressor is figured as feminine. The hell houses harness the feeling of fear to offer a way out, an offer of conversion at the end of the tour. I would have liked to hear more about what options are offered to the apocalypses hearers who are often witnessing the punishment of clerics or other Christian insiders. But one piece Henning communicates masterfully is the unendingness of hell, its inescapability for those within it. This comes to the fore particularly vividly in the example in the Ethiopic Apocalypse of Peter, 
of the mothers who killed their children. An initial movement of radical distancing, putting the child away in life, is answered in the afterlife by the emergence of monsters from the breasts. Most fearsome, the monsters emerge from you painfully and return to attack a circle of return in which there is no distance, nowhere to run. The danger of slipping into a worse form of embodiment, the fear of being penetrated, soft, cold, feminized, disabled, lends force to this aspect of damnation. And the value I sense there of a worse form of embodiment is the one that is inscribed by the text, not one that I'm imparting. Henning offers another spatialization of hell in addition to the terrifying hell house the heterotopic museum focused on exhibition and classification. Henning draws on Foucault's notion of the heterotopia or other space, a single space that contains many other places and times within it. Unlike the utopia, the heterotopia exists in real space time often. As examples, Foucault gives the library, the cemetery and the museum. And I wanna add, because this word has come up a few times, the mirror he gives as an example of the heterotopia, and Henning gives the hellscape. Foucault's work on heterotopias was preliminary and partial, but postcolonial museum studies can augment our understanding of the way heterotopias work affectively. I wonder if we might consider affects of colonizing, fetishizing curiosity and mastery here, not a desire to flee, but a desire to collect and observe. Indeed, saint and savior alike demonstrate their mastery of the hellscape by moving through it unscathed and being able to explain it. We need only think of the docent of the British Museum moving tourists calmly past stolen loot. But the museum project is also always a way of constructing the collective self. We are something other than this. To take a Foucauldian tack by way of Schneider, quote, the repressed other is not a byproduct of the dominant same, but produces it, end quote. Henning notes that unlike other heterotopias, the hellscape has the uncanny effect of collapsing the barrier between subject and object. That is, since the exhibited damned body is re so relatable, the viewer can mentally switch places with it. What seems like a tour of a distant place, distant place full of strange beasts and tortures can quickly become a tour of one's own future. I'm reminded of my own evangelical childhood, punctuated by Jack Trick Tracks, in which after death, I am forced to watch a movie of my own sins in front of God and everyone. The judge sees, classifies, and punishes accordingly. Foucault doesn't explicitly link his heterotopias to the juridical logics of classification and taxonomy he explicates elsewhere, but it can be done. Henning argues that these damned bodies teach. They teach that sin can be read on a body, both in life and after it. They teach that the afterlife follows the same juridical rules as the Roman Empire. They teach the ethics that merit harsh punishment. Henning also draws on spatial language and comparisons, the heterotopia, the hell house, the mines, the prison. An affective lens on hell hellscape pedagogies allows us to ask how these teachings stick through fear, curiosity, titillation, identification, or shame. These are unlike Schneider's Dante and Hellscape, which reclaims the shame of the closet with humor, surprise, and irreverence, and forges ahead into the very innards of hell. I close with a few questions. Um, it seems to me that in these apocalypses, the damned are often Christians rather than hell being a punishment for non-belief, which fits well with the knowledge that ancient Christianity is focused on orthopraxy. But I was wondering if we can talk about this a little bit more. I'm thinking of your section in chapter four on the soteriological aspects of hellscapes and thinking that the heaven hell dyad must function differently in antiquity than it does today. Um, and second, I've left out a space in my discussion, the space of the mines full of fumes. Um, and I wonder how we could imagine the affects here as pedagogical affects of confinement, despair, and even in a spatial way, the affective logics of dismemberment in another sort of punishment that we see. 
Um, but thank you so much, Megan, for this excellent and needed book. And I'm really decided, delighted to have read it. And it's a really pretty color green. <laughs> thank you very much. We'll now hear uh, from Peter Mena. Peter, the floor is yours. Great. Um, thank you, Sarah. Thank you, Christy. It's really nice to see uh, resonances with my own thinking um, as I was reading Megan's work. Um, I want to begin by thanking uh, Dr. Henning for her important work in this smart, engaging, and very timely book, as other panelists have pointed out. As I read it, I found myself taking copious notes, not directly related to the book's central topic nor argument, but rather on many different ideas, discourses, both pre-modern and contemporary, and a host of other related and tangential avenues of exploration that Henning's work invites its readers to ruminate on. I add to this note, uh, I rather, I add to this a note of gratitude for the copious footnotes and expansive and impressive bibliography uh, that she has called together uh, through her research on early and late ancient Christian depictions of hell. I wanna first highlight moments of appreciation that I had as I read Dr. Henning's book, and then finish with some questions that were raised for me as I journeyed with her to a multitude of Christian hellscapes and back. Hell Hath No Fury brings together apocalyptic literature from Christian late antiquity in order to re-examine how the various hellscapes evocatively described within the genre construct persisting ideas about bodies and the damned. Henning elegantly takes her readers on an exciting journey through the apocalyptic literature of late antiquity, the reception history of these texts, and her own reading of them aided by the queer gender and disability theoretical framework she utilizes. Her meticulously researched and meticulously constructed argument demonstrates some of the best one could desire out of contemporary scholarship. Henning guides her readers on an innovative and fascinating reading of late ancient apocalyptic literature while simultaneously demonstrating how this literature constructed ideas about bodies and gender that have persisted into our contemporary moment. In this way, Henning argues that in the apocalyptic literature of late antiquity, Christian authors contributed to a way of viewing and categorizing bodies that has had lasting and detrimental effects. Henning connects these histories with more recent histories of oppression, such as the ongoing policing of women's bodies, anti-Black racism, ableism, queer phobia, and other historical and contemporary injustices. Henning locates her argument and its relevance amidst the struggles for freedom and contemporary discourses of social justice in the United States. Another moment of appreciation I had as I read Hell, Hell Hath No Fury was the painstaking way that Henning builds her argument. Taking us from one hellscape to the next, she invites us to see beyond what other scholars have seen and to read or listen to the words of the ancient apocalypses and understand them in ways that their initial audiences may have. Importantly, Henning demonstrates her argument through evidence found in the text, but she also highlights where some textual evidence diverges from her theories. And in this way, she attunes us to important historiographic issues. Henning reminds us that Christianity in antiquity was not monolithic and therefore, while patterns of continuity may be discerned, they should not stand in for the nuance of shifting temporal and cultural context. I was very delighted as I read Hell Hath No Fury, as I turned each page, which may sound strange, I know there's <laughs> evocative images of um, grotesque suffering, but um, no less, as I turned each page, I was struck by Professor Henning's breadth and depth of analysis as she applied her reading and theoretical and methodo methodological tools to her study. As I said before, there were several moments of contact where something I learned as I read Henning's work sparked ideas for further exploration and other questions that I'm grateful for this opportunity to dialogue with her about and with others as well. Um, in this way, these are not critiques, but genuine questions that arose for me as, um, as I was reading um, Dr. Henning's work. I'm very interested in Professor Henning's reading of early and late ancient Christian hellscapes as heterotopias. Of course, this has already been brought up um, by the other panelists. To my mind, 
Heterotopias rely on the reality of their approximation in order to exist. So for Foucault, what a mirror shows us is utopic because it is a non-space. However accurately, it approximates a reflection of a real space. And indeed on page 85, Henning tells us, um, tells us of her departure from Foucault's thinking on exactly these grounds. She writes, here I depart from Foucault, who in my view distinguished too sharply between real and imaginary spaces. He also does not consider the possibility that sparking imagination may also be an important primary function of some of these other spaces, which are objects of the visitor's gaze, end quote. Here I want to invite Henning to reflect more on the role of imagination in constructing reality. It seems to me, as I read her argument, that much rests on the importance of reading hell as a real space. To be sure, Henning tells us, quote, since Foucault was working primarily with modern history, he might have placed other worlds, by which she is indicating hell as another world, into the category of utopia due to their imaginary nature. For ancient audiences of the apocalyptic texts, however, these spaces were real indeed and closely connected to present realities. For this reason, apocalyptic, apocalyptic hell, hells fit Foucault's definition of heterotopia as a space that is both mythic and real and calls lived spaces into question, end quote. To be clear, I'm not pushing against the notion that hell could be conceived of as a very real space to ancient audiences of apocalyptic literature. Since Peter, Peter Brown's The Making of Late Antiquity, many scholars of the period, myself included, have been willing to regard the late ancient Mediterranean world where people, quote, share their world with invisible beings largely more powerful than themselves to whom they had to relate, end quote, as intuitive. I'm more interested here in the question of space and how we theorize it. For my own purposes, I've considered the real and imagined spaces of the late ancient desert described by Christian hagiographers. In my reading, the real and imagined space of the desert takes on the tenor of a borderland space, which I read through the lens of Chicana feminists like Gloria Anzaldúa. But I attempt to reconcile what Brown refers to as, quote, the myth of the desert with the fact that the desert exists today and in many ways as it did in antiquity as a very real space. One only needed to travel a certain distance to see the very real space of the desert, which then opened a world of imaginative possibilities for late ancient hagiographers. Hell feels different to me. Hell relies much more heavily on imagination and therefore requires more of readers, ancient and contemporary alike, to reflect back on earth the kind of space that it is. So perhaps what I'm asking here is if Professor Henning could say more about her use of Foucault's work, how she understands hellscapes as heterotopias, and her view that these hellscapes described in the apocalypses could primarily function as a means to spark the imaginations of readers, of their readers, as she suggests. Uh, the second, and because of time, the final avenue of exploration I want to ask Professor Henning about is related to the first. I'm quite curious about hell houses. I have a lot to say about hell houses, by the way. I also grew up in Texas. Um, I have experienced them, though as a Catholic, they seemed, I think, somewhat more distant. Um, but anyways, more to say perhaps later in our discussion. Um, they are as fascinating as they are troubling. They are indeed theological in that they attempt to demonstrate a very particular theology about sin and eternal damnation. But part of what fascinates me about them is their theatricality. Hell houses rely on imagination, but they also rely on the exhilaration of temporary fear. The draw of a hell house is that like a haunted house, you will be terrified, but have the comfort and safety of knowing that what you are viewing is not real. It is only imagined. Even if one were to believe in the, the reality of the possibility that there is indeed a hell and that it would resemble what they viewed in a hell house, they still know, even as they watch the horror show, pregnant with so many social, cultural, political meanings, that they are safe. Anne Pellegrini has an excellent article on hell houses in which she seeks to analyze their performative function using a host of scholarly resources, documentaries, information videos, and interviews 
Pellegrini takes readers behind the scenes of a hell house, so to speak, to show how those who put one on do so. One, she has much more uh, reasons for her argument, but that's one of the things that this article does. And one of the more interesting aspects of Pellegrini's work is to demonstrate fears over performance bleeding into reality. So for example, she discusses how one Hell House kit instructs producers, and you can buy kits for Hell Houses should you want to put one on, um, you yourself can purchase one and, and follow the directions. Um, <laughs> So, uh, sorry, uh, the Hell House kit instructs producers not to have same gender persons, uh, I'm sorry, persons of the same gender play the roles of couples in same gender weddings. The fear is that the performance of a same gender wedding by persons of the same gender approximates an actual same gender wedding a little too close for comfort. Pellegrini goes on to discuss how a group of young adults who perform the rave or dance club scenes often cite these performances as their favorites to do because they glimpse the tenor of those spaces all in the guise of theological education. With regard to the scenes involving queer characters, Pellegrini writes, quote, the uptake of a message is not fully determined by the sender's intentions misfires happen all the time, especially when it comes to sexual representations. Can we rule out the possibility that for some young people, GLBT, questioning or otherwise, just getting a glimpse of the same sex eroticism is a perverse pleasure, revealing possibilities they were not otherwise supposed to contemplate? In other words, what if the very medium Hell House uses to reach its audience, theater, Queers the pitch of the message, end quote. It's this question about hell houses and Henning's apt use of them to think about ancient apocalyptic literature as having seeded these later expressions of Christian fundamentalism that has me now thinking about the apocalypse as ancient hell houses themselves. I wonder, Professor Henning, what you think about these texts as simultaneously inciting fear as well as exhilaration fun, joy even, at the spectacle of the damned bodies in a space that is hell, that might seem more remote than we allow for in, I'm sorry, than we allow for in our reading of ancient texts. Now, I'm not suggesting, of course, that there is anything fun or joyful about damning particular real, real earthly bodies, just as there is no fun and joy for myself watching ghouls and monsters delight in dragging a gay man who died of AIDS to hell in a particularly horrendous hell house that I went to as a teenager. But as I read Christian apocalypses along with Henning, I'm struck by the imaginative function of these texts and their performance to ancient audiences. What might that experience have been like? And is it possible to imagine these texts um, as multivalent for us and ancient audiences alike? And so here I'm, I'm going back, Megan, to what you said at the beginning and thinking of maybe if these texts can be found somewhere either in between or maybe both and the sort of banal popular literature, um, as well as these kind of high theological um, texts. Again, I wanna thank Megan Henning for this excellent work. Like any good work of scholarly engagement, it has opened up so many more questions and ideas for myself. And I'm grateful for this opportunity to be in conversation with my colleagues about this book today. Thank you very much, Peter. We will now turn to our last reviewer, Sonia Anderson. Sonia, the floor is yours. Thank you. Okay. I have just a couple slides for you. Will you give me a thumbs up if you see them? All right. I finished reading Meg Henning's Hell Hath No Fury on Friday 24th, the day the US Supreme Court overturned Roe v. Wade. As I toggled between the Washington Post and the New York Times, her book's epilogue took on new resonance. In at least some US contexts, Meg writes, the pregnant nursing body is both idealized and penalized. And not just pregnant nursing bodies, but feminized bodies more generally. Seeing female bodies in pain is comfortable and even normal or eroticized. Something you can see in horror, action, or drama films from any decade. Humiliation, mutilation, and rape are time-honored ways to make female characters more interesting to the male viewer. 
As, Amer as Times columnist Jessica Bennett puts it, we love to watch a woman brought low. To be brought low, to be made publicly vulnerable because of how society regards one's body. This is something familiar, not only to women, but to black Americans of any gender and to disabled people. Ableist society, white supremacist society, patriarchal society produces forms of alterity and turns them into spectacles for entertainment and edification. Think of how much black suffering and death we consume through cell phones of police murders, or even through a comedy series, as Megan notes, like Orange is the New Black. Think of how Disney villains are marked by their bodily impairments, a peg leg, a twisted back, a scarred face. We are used to seeing certain bodies punished and held up for our pity, horror, or titillation. Why is my screen sharing paused? There we go. Megan's book takes us back to the ancient Christian precursor of this phenomenon, the tour of hell. Like the hell houses of modern evangelicalism, ancient tours of hell feature writhing broken bodies in scenes that could be found on earth, in prisons, in courtrooms, in the mines, in the arena. Tours of hell were much more than warnings not to sin. They were in your face lessons in how to dis distinguish a desirable body from an undesirable one, an honorable body from a body brought low. There's nothing neutral about the torments borne by the damned. Even in hell, women cannot escape sexualized violence. And for men, hell just is feminization. Hell reinscribed earthly cultural scripts and turned them up to 11. Meg, you've argued this thoroughly and lucidly. I wanna spend the rest of my remarks thinking about your book in conjunction with a piece that I teach every chance I get. Robert Orsi's essay, Mildred, Is It Fun to Be a Cripple? The Culture of Suffering in Mid 20th Century American Catholicism. Physical distress of all sorts, Orsi writes, from conditions like cerebral palsy to the unexpected agonies of accidents and illness was understood by American Catholics in the middle years of the last century as an individual's main opportunity for spiritual growth. Pain was a ladder to heaven. The saints were unhappy unless they were in physical distress of some sort. This meant that cripples or permanently disabled people were special people, Orsi says, God's children chosen by him for a special destiny, innocent victims, cheerful sufferers, God's most beloved, who dwelt on made holy by the presence of deads and wheelchairs and twisted bodies. If suffering was sanctity, who was more saint-like than the physically disabled? You can see the theological roots of this culture in Catholic children's literature from the 1960s. This is from the 1960s, by the way, it was put back into publication in 2008. So children are being taught by this same textbook. Consider the back cover of the Baltimore Catechism meant to etch itself into the mind's eye. Look at Jesus as Mary did. See his bleeding wounds. See the nails in his hands and feet. See the thorns in his head. See his side open for us to enter. See how much he loves us. How do you think our lady felt? How should we feel? If Jesus loves us so much, what are we going to do for him today? Feelings of love and feelings of pity. The desire to do good and the desire to dwell on graphic images of physical pain. These are deeply intertwined. Bodily suffering was the wages of sin on the one hand and the embodiment of holiness on the other. Christ's body is disabled and so disability is an imitation of Christ. And when it comes to imitation of Christ, more, the more the better. Here's where discourses of disability take on a voyeuristic, objectifying tone in Christian literature. Again, let me quote Orsi at length. Catholics thrilled to describe the body in pain, 
devotional prose was generally overwrought, but on this subject it exceeded itself. There was an excess of a certain kind of sensuous detail in Catholic accounts of pain and suffering, a delicious lingering over and savoring of other people's pain. A dying man is presented in a story in a 1937 issue of the devotional magazine Ave Maria as having lain for 21 years on the broad of his back, suffering from arthritis, his hands and fingers so distorted that he could not raise them more than an inch, his teeth set, so physically handicapped that in the summer he could not brush away a fly or mosquito from his face because of his condition. It was never enough in this aesthetic to say simply cancer, as stark as that word is. Instead, it had to be the cancer that is all pain. Wounds always throbbed. Suffering was always untold. Pain invariably took its victims to the very limits of endurance. The disabled were holy, superhuman even. But as Orsi notes, there's a fine line between superhuman and subhuman. The very discourse that elevates the suffering body tightly scripts its desires, actions, and its reception by others. Cripples were holy, but only when they suffered cheerfully and only when they offered up their pain for the welfare of the able-bodied. This darkly erotic aesthetic of pain, Orsi's phrase, was too powerful to be confined to the mid-century. Here is a holy card that I picked up last year at my local chapel. Prayer to the shoulder wound of Jesus. I'll read it for you. It's related in the annals of Clairvaux that St. Bernard asked our Lord, which was his greatest unrecorded suffering? And our Lord answered, I had on my shoulder while I bore my cross on the way of sorrows, a grievous wound, which was more painful than the others and which is not recorded by men. Honor this wound with thy devotion and I'll grant thee whatever thou dost ask through its virtue and merit. In regard to all those who shall venerate this wound, I will remit to them all their venial sins and will no longer remember their mortal sins. And there's a prayer on the back that the reader is supposed to recite. Loving Jesus, meek Lamb of God, I'm a miserable sinner. Uh, I am a miserable sinner. Salute and worship the most sacred wound of thy shoulder, on which thou didst bear thy heavy cross, which so tore thy flesh and laid bare thy bones as to inflict on thee an anguish greater than any other wound of thy most blessed body. I adore thee, O Jesus, most sorrowful. And it goes on, uh, hoping for uh, redemption and that Jesus will lead me on towards heaven along the way of thy cross, amen. Sore wounds and anguished bodies is what redemption looks like on this card. It's also, as we saw in Meg's book, what damnation looks like. So here's what I would love to hear more about. Sanctity and suffering, martyrdom and the pains of hell. How different are they? I'm thinking of the text that we all know so well, of Anthony's body beaten day and night by demons, Syncletica's mouth rotted out by infection, Chrysostom's orations on flowing blood and melted flesh, and old Eliezer's sides being cut to pieces in 4th Maccabees. The violent sexualizations there too. Remember Prudentius's hymn on Agnes. It's at once sex scene, and rape scene. This butcher is the lover who pleases me. His bold advances I shall go forth to meet and will not try to hinder his ardent suit. I gladly bear my breast to his cruel steel and deep into my heart I will draw a blade. Plato's Phaedo says the philosopher's goal is to live in a state as close to death as possible. And early Christian hagiography offered its reader an array of such nearly dead bodies, ripe for veneration, imitation, and longing. It seems to me that the same bodies appear in hell, only you're supposed to feel horror or pity upon seeing them. But what they endure, dismemberment, captivity, fire, beatings, laceration, is exactly what the saints endure, though to different ends. The suffering of saints and holy cripples is every bit as sexualized and objectifying as the torments of the damned. Does that sound correct to you, 
or am I thinking about this too flatly? Thanks. Excellent, everyone, for your wonderful reviews. We'll now take about a three minute break, a stretch break. I encourage you to get up, uh, move around a little bit, and then we will hear from Megan as a response to the reviews. And then we will open the floor uh, for other participants to offer their questions and comments. So I have 4.07 at my time. We'll reconvene around uh, 10 after or so, okay? Thank you. Sonia, did you happen to come across that uh, pamphlet on accident or, I mean, were you looking for such resources from different? Uh, uh, oh, you mean yeah. the holy card? Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, it was just in the little rack of devotional literature, which some, some of which is very old, but this is a phenomenon that you find in Catholic chapels a lot is that you know, pious people will come by and they'll deposit um, holy cards that they've collected. Uh, sometimes, you know, the cards are, yeah, they're a statement, they're a way to be subversive. Um, and sometimes there's no further intention behind them awesome. other than I just had these in the chapel literature rack seems like a place. But when I saw it, I thought, oh, my God, I got to grab this for teaching. Um, and there were several uh, that was published by um, a an outfit called, I think, Our Lady of the Rosary Library. Um, and they have a lot of really old um, holy cards, the kind that, you know, promise for every three of these prayers recited, this many souls will be released from purgatory. Wow. Um, yeah, so they're really wonderful uh, primary texts. Yeah, that's fascinating. Thank you. Uh, let us reconvene formally and come back as a group. Uh, 
Megan, we'll now turn it over to you to offer a response. Uh, you're welcome to take as long as you'd like, but we would still like some time for a conversation with our other guests. Thank you. Um, so first, I want to say thank you again to uh, the respondent. Wow, what beautiful, moving, inspiring, engaging responses. Um, I could ask for or imagine for nothing better. And it really is um, wonderful to, to have such responses to a work that a person has spent this much time on. So I really am honored, thank you. Um, and really intrigued by the different materials that you all brought in as well. Um, that was really a, a great way to add dimension to the conversation. So I also wanna make sure we have time for discussion as well. Let me, I was organizing my thoughts on the break to make sure that I had bolded everybody's questions. So I, I respond to everything. Um, so we'll just go in the order of the responses if that's okay with everyone else. So Christy, um, absolutely. So as I was writing the book, I also was constantly collecting examples from the epilogue. And this is one of those projects that um, I would prefer if it weren't so relevant um, and continually offering new points of contact for the contemporary world. Uh, and yet I think it offers us an opportunity to think about this thing that we keep liking to do, which is to use the bodies of the minoritized to think with in our culture and then exacting violence on them based upon the ways that we've constructed our thoughts and our social world. So um, absolutely, in the last couple of weeks, I agree that um, not only the Roe versus Wade court decision, but many other Supreme Court decisions, it's really, they're sort of on a roll in the last two weeks. Um, indigenous people groups, uh, it seems that maybe voters' rights. See, it seems like no one is, is safe from uh, having their body thought with as a, a legal prop at the moment in the United States context. And I don't think it's unique to the United States. I use those up examples in the epilogue simply because they are the most familiar to me and they are my own context. And I wanted to avoid further using this rhetoric to colonize other, <laughs> um, other spaces by trying to jump in and assume that I understand what's going on in context that I myself don't inhabit. Um, so, but one of the things that has also in the last two weeks really stood out to me is that as you say, um, we're teetering on similar punishments being enacted on women and also people with disabilities and also, also specifically minoritized women, impoverished or economically disadvantaged or um, racial minorities um, for whom uh, abortion absolutely is healthcare in a number of different situations. So, um, there are a number of disabled women who do not wish to have children who simply need to take um, medications for chronic pain and other chronic illnesses, but because the medication acts as an abortificant, they are no longer allowed to take their prescription medication and are required to live with their chronic pain. Um, and the entire conversation in the media, both before the past two weeks, but increasingly in the last two weeks, continues to be framed around women as maximally responsible for parenthood, but with minimal agency or support. And that is where I see a terrifying point of contact to the breast milk beasts in these texts. So thank you for bringing that to the surface and helping us to reflect on that in a really powerful way. I'm really grateful. Um, Sarah, so I was not familiar with Snyder's text and I, I would love that reference as well. Um, I also, um, as you were talking about museum studies, I think that's a, a really wonderful and as well as affect theory, I think those would both be um, and are addi a great additions to this conversation and could be their own article or piece. I, I think what 
initially attract me to the idea of heterotopia in Foucault and where I started to see the resonance was his the image of the zoo um, or the museum that he uses because hell absolutely functions this way. It, um, it colonizes, it fetishizes, and it gives you the sense of mastery, but also proximity and control. Um, and I loved how you said that, um, you know, it's always this way of constructing the collective self. We are something other than this. I was just in Berlin um, last month and they have, you know, these gorgeous museums. And I was at the, um, the temporary exhibit of the Pergamon Museum because the Pergamon Museum is still under construction, but they had all of these placards there that are carefully constructed to distance them, the, the museum and the curators of the collection from theft and cultural appropriation of materials. Um, they talk about the preservation of these materials, especially during World War II. The narratives are not untrue. Um, many of those materials would have been destroyed, but still as images of enslavement and, uh, and violence and uh, imperialism are on display, in the Pergamon panorama. There are all of these placards in the spaces next to the, um, the stone reliefs and the material objects that are very, very careful to talk about the ways in which we, the museum goers, we, the museum curators, we, the um, participants in museum culture are very different from the kind of colonial projects that we see in the depiction of Pergamon. Uh, so for your two questions, uh, I, I think uh, specifically your first question, okay, um, are, are these all aimed at Christians? And um, uh, can I explain this a bit more? And specifically you said that um, you're thinking about the soteriological section in chapter four, which is the Mary chapter where she does all of her um, work. So I, the Mary chapter was the second hardest chapter of the book to write for this reason, because I wanted to talk about the gender aspects of this work where, and the, and the way that Mary queers the dissensus tradition. But I also have to deal with the constructive theological piece and a whole history of scholarship that has exclusively talked about the dissensus with respect to the patristic texts and, uh, and specific apocryphal texts, but not the Marian ones. And so I found myself trying to answer these theological questions, but doing so in a way that also is interrogating the way that the theological questions have been framed both by some of our ancient sources and by we as scholars who have been reading those ancient sources for hundreds of years. And so I think that many of the texts are aimed at Christians, you're absolutely right. And it's striking, I think for us in the US specifically, because thanks to Jonathan Edwards and particular strands of Protestant Christianity, the primary function of hell in our context as it is presented is as one of salvation. You primarily think about hell so that you can confess Jesus as your Lord and savior and become a Christian. But that is not what these texts are interested in at all. You're absolutely right that they are primarily aimed at Christians. And I think at least um, I'm hoping to make this argument later in some articles leading up to the Apocalypse of Peter commentary, but I think the Apocalypse of Peter is absolutely aimed at elite, an elite audience. So not just Christians, but specifically elite Christians. And if that's the case, then how do we get right to this place where they seem to be doing some soteriological work in the ancient world? So I think they are doing soteriological work and that's why we get, um, it's only in the Marian tours of hell, right? Where Mary's sacrifice for the damned and offer to stand in their place um, and entreaties to God and to her son are efficacious. And those texts primarily um, regionally come from Eastern Christianity. Um, and there's this fundamental difference, of course, between the Eastern church and the Western church on 
whether or not hell still has sway, right? Uh, and so it's not surprising then that the Marian apocalypses, which are very, very popular in, East, in the Eastern church and are used in liturgy there, are the ones where the point of this is to show you that in fact, we're all going to be saved because Mary has done this amazing thing. Go Mary. Um, and if the book hadn't been um, published in the Yale Anchor series, which I'm grateful that it was, and there was an opportunity to have a cover for the book, the image that I would have picked is the one of Mary punching the devil in the face. Um, <laughs> because in my mind, when I think of the, that chapter, that's what I think is going on. Um, but I do think that because we have so many different texts and they're a, a, across a broad geographic and temporal range, it's also possible that they're doing different things. And when I answer one of Peter's questions, we'll get to that as well. Um, I think that the minds absolutely have, so your second question was, are, is there affect involved in the minds themselves, right? What's going on? with these prison spaces. And I'm very much looking forward to the um, continued work. They already have articles published on this of Matt Larson and, and Mark Letney on prisons. But I absolutely think that the purpose of these punishments, and we see this in some of the scholarship on the martyrdom literature as well, right? The purpose of these punishments in the Roman context, and then as Christians appropriate it in their own context is to pull at the emotions of the audience and to persuade them to avoid particular things or to view minoritized members of society in an even more degrading way than they already do. Uh, and I think that affect theory absolutely would be very helpful for thinking about that there. And in my next project, as I'm working on um, prayer and emotions in the body, I'll also need to dive into that some more as well. And I, I admit that affect theory is not something that I am fully steeped in yet. So I have more work to do on that, but thank you for adding that to the mix. Okay, so Peter, heterotopias. Um, you asked me to say more about Foucault and specifically how I understand hellscape, hell spaces and heterotopias, as heterotopias and how they spark the imaginations of readers. And I really loved um, you're bringing in here the idea of the desert as borderland with Chicana feminism and that, you know, of course, the desert exists today as a very real space. Um, and you said that you thought hell feels different. And I think it's different, but also the same. And here's why. I see myself as Foucauldian and that I do take seriously his claim that our task is to identify and respond to whatever is dangerous in our own episteme. Even if that now means the work of Foucault himself. And so while Foucault's heterotopia is really alluring to me, the concept of the zoo or the museum really fits and I, I get drawn into that as I just mentioned. I also think that we have to be careful about articulating the difference between antiquity and our own context, as well as assessing and responding to the danger of flattening these spaces and the way that they exist in three dimensions in antiquity. So I think, well, there's no space in antiquity exactly like hell in the way that the desert is really here, right? Um, they do try to identify where the gate of Hades was, right? Um, uh, in Turkey, just last week, you can go now and tour one of the hell gates. <laughs> so, um, and the, and the, um, the descriptions in Strabo and other um, ancient authors describing Hades also talk about um, the noxious fumes. So anywhere that there were um, sulfurous bodies of water, like the Dead Sea, right? People thought that this was possibly a portal to the underworld. Uh, and then also, if we think about the carceral spaces that existed, of course, the carceral spaces are not exactly hell in the way that the desert is exactly the desert. And yet they look so much like what's happening in hell that it's very hard to imagine ancient imaginations not going there. When I saw that um, Larson and Letney gave a presentation at the Birmingham seminar, for example, on their work on prisons, and they gave this wonderful tour of the archeological space. And I just had never thought about it before, but of course 
there are no bathrooms in the mines, right? There are, they, people are defecating in these spaces of imprisonment and then living in them and working in them nonstop. Um, and that's very, very similar to the filth and muck and mire of hell, right? Where people are um, in the apocalypse of Paul, the punishment that's supposed to be the worst of all. Um, and it's particularly for those who I believe, if I'm remembering correctly, I, it is an occupational hazard that sometimes I get these mixed up with each other, but I believe it's for um, those who uh, deny that the Eucharist is really the body and blood of Christ. And that punishment is that you are in a space that smells worse than any other space. And it's the lowest in hell, right? Which sounds very, very much like the condemnation to the minds. Um, and then your question about hell houses. I would love the reference to the Anne Pellegrini article. I don't know it. So that it sounds really fascinating. Um, what do I think about these texts as simultaneously eliciting fear and exhilaration? Um, I agree that there's nothing fun or joyful about damning real bodies. And I frequently have to be careful and stop myself as a number of you had to, as you were doing your review about saying like, oh, I, I found this really fun text or this really great piece of evidence. And it's like actually something horrifying and disgusting and violent. So um, that's, <laughs> that happens to me all the time too. Um, what I merely mean to say is interesting. Um, but what might these experiences have been like? And are these texts multivalent for ancient audiences? Can these texts be found in between popular literature and theological? Absolutely. I think this is one of those places where our genre distinctions have just messed us up, right? We, the genre distinctions are helpful as a heuristic. And then when we forget that they're a heuristic, we can really go down a rabbit trail that's unproductive. <laughs> And, and I think um, we see this in some of Augustine and Chrysostom's distinct responses to these texts and traditions. Chrysostom talks about how he wishes he could always be preaching about how, how he loves this material. He talks uh, explicitly about um, hell as a mine, only indescribably worse, right? Um, and he kind of relishes in the imagery specifically and, and thinks about it as, um, pedagogically, theologically, and persuasively powerful, right? He sees it as constructive, absolutely. Augustine, however, really, really struggles and, and condemns the, I, we think that he's talking specifically about the apocalypse of Peter. He doesn't think that it is vivid enough or terrifying enough and therefore can't be theologically productive because the damned are given a day of respite. And that is theologically um, not useful because nobody's gonna avoid hell if they know that there's a way out. And so he clearly sees these as titillating texts that people are circulating and producing for entertainment purposes to some extent, or at least he wants to demarcate them that way. And I do think that they survive and are um, present in such great a number in our manuscript tradition, not because of the unique theological content that they contain, right? But because they're doing this powerful work that probably was entertaining for ancient audiences. Um, I think that they were used in liturgy specifically on Good Friday uh, because they're so evocative, because they have this affective function. So I like that question a lot because it brings to the surface the way in which um, even these pieces of evidence that we don't spend very much time talking about are not really just one thing. Um, and there's more there for us to mine uh, in terms of what they can tell us about how early Christians responded differently and engaged different parts um, of the culture that they were a part of. I mean, the, the tradition is long. They're drawing absolutely on um, both Jewish apocalyptic tours and uh, Greek and Roman and other cultural imaginations of hell and 
in doing so, they really tap into a medium that is maximally rhetorically persuasive and productive. And that's also why I think, you know, Dante and Jonathan Edwards couldn't resist it either, um, or the contemporary Hell House, right? The, the strange thing though, is that um, at least in the United States, we've really, really latched on to the rhetoric um, and completely abandoned any of the emphasis, for example, on the Sermon on the Mount that is really central um, to a lot of these texts. You don't see a hell house that I know of um, where people are punished for not giving money to the poor, um, which is like a real big punishment in these texts. <laughs> so I think that that's really telling as well in terms of the way in which people are really latching on to uh, the imagery itself and the, the entertainment value. All right, Sonia, um, thank you for bringing in all of these really fascinating uh, examples from the contemporary world. Uh, Jessica Bennett's quote is really helpful, I think for centering the way that we take these scripts and as you said, turn them, the scripts of alterity and turn them up to an 11. Um, I loved that. Uh, the Bob Orsi piece, uh, when I started teaching at UD, one of my colleagues put that in my hands and I was like, oh yeah, <laughs> this is really, really helpful for, um, for framing the way that we think about this in a Catholic educational context. Uh, I had not seen the St. Joseph Baltimore Catechism and did not know that it had been reprinted in 2008. So um, that is really stunning. Uh, the idea that you mentioned about how there's a fine line between subhuman and superhuman. Rosemary Garland Thompson, the sort of grandmother of disability studies um, in her book, Extraordinary Bodies, really traverses that well. She really focuses, she's a um, scholar specifically of literature, and she focuses on the um, freak show as her uh, object. And the early modern freak show is different in lots of ways from ancient hell. But at the same time, it functions very similarly um, in terms of the way in which um, the, the same discursive practices that enable the disabled body in hell to work as a think piece also work in the other texts that you brought up um, as well around martyrdom and the sanctity of suffering. Um, the prayer to the shoulder wound prayer card made me think specifically of a scene in the Liber Requii, or I call it the Book of Mary's Repose in the book so that people don't have to constantly be reading Latin titles. Um, <laughs> if, they're, if they are a um, broad audience member. Um, but just after Mary tours hell, she and the disciples go to heaven. And um, there's a scene where Peter and the disciples are questioning Jesus because he still has his stigmata in heaven. And they say, why haven't you healed yourself? And Jesus says, I am not going to heal myself until everybody has received their catechism, essentially, right? And so just a few moments earlier, right? The disabled body in hell is how um, the audience is educated. And then Jesus's disabled body in heaven offers education immediately after um, to the disciples and to all who are reading the text. Uh, the, um, I, th I don't think you're reading this flatly at all with respect to martyrdom. I talk a little bit about martyrdom in chapter one, um, specifically around martyrdom and gender, but I think um, bringing this back full circle is really the next step. And um, Candida Moss and I have a, um, article forthcoming in the Journal of the American Academy of Religion, um, specifically about the way in which the pulling apart of bodies in hell and the piecing back together of bodies in heaven are part of a, a, the, really the same set of discursive practices around disability. Obviously the argument's much more nuanced and um, I'll, I'll distribute it when it gets published, but we wrote it some time ago now, so I'm probably articulating it inarticulately. Um, <laughs> but
but I do think that you're not, you're definitely not reading that too flatly. There is something going on there. And that's the next kind of question is, okay, now that we've focused really intently on disability in these hell texts where disability is functioning as the suffering object, what does this mean for the way that we think of early Christianity broadly and the role of the disabled body, the role of the female body, the role of the effeminate body, the role of the enslaved body, the role of the ethnically marked as other body in antiquity um, in all of the spaces that these bodies might have inhabited? And was, was there some way that early Christians are keeping these held together as a piece? Or is there some kind of cognitive dissonance involved? Are they compartmentalizing? I think that's what we need to put together next. And by we, I mean, probably not me. But <laughs> I'm going to keep thinking about these things, but I'm also going to try to get out of hell, y'all. So, <laughs> so um, I think that that's a great place for me to stop rambling. Um, but oh, I did want to say too that I, I think this is one of the things that uh, this book is not just about gender and disability. And, and frankly, I think that people who want it to, to be like a constructive theology or pithy take on gender or disability in Christianity might be disappointed. Um, here, I'm really trying to give as detailed an account as possible about the explicit ways in which being a woman was seen as a disability and disability was effeminizing by tracing a wide range of evidence. But ultimately, this is about the interlocking and intersectional layered ways that, as Candida Moss has said, the dead create and recreate social hierarchy. Um, and, and so I think there, um, while disability studies has focused on the enlightenment or the modern medical gaze as the points of origin for the disciplinary regime and bodily normativity, what I have been struck by in the last few years is the way that early Christian hell shows us that these ideas simply have much deeper roots. Um, and so we really have a lot more work to do. Thanks. Excellent, excellent. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Megan, for your comments. Thank you all to our reviewers. We'll now move to open discussion among all participants. Uh, we welcome um, everyone to use the chat if they would like to chime in with comments or questions for Megan or any of the panelists. And also use the raised hand feature if you'd like to join us on screen. Uh, Sid will start us off here. Also, Melanie joined us on screen, so we'll welcome her comments in a moment if she has anything. Uh, so, Sid, we'll start with you. Uh, what are your reflections? Oh, my goodness. Thank you so much. It was just... It was so difficult because, you know, I hear your piece and I'm just like all of these questions and then all the respondents, I'm just like, oh my God, what about this? What about this? What about this? Um, and, and I think one of the two, th two things, I think one, um, my main research deals with disgust. And one of the, the biggest things about disgust is that it is a boundary marker, right? And it is also an emotion that we actually use to order our moral and just cosmological orderings, right? Um, and so in these portrayals of sort of the, the disability and the damned, and you, to a certain degree, sometimes like, do we even say disability and the damned? Because they might as well just be the same because we it, it, when they're so conflated, like, yes, to a certain degree, yes, we should pull them apart because they're not the same, right? But in terms of sort of just like the lived out reality, we're, I don't know if we're having a disability and the damn conversations when they're pretty much one and the same, right? And so, so obviously it's important to tease those apart because they're not the same. But in, in, in cases like uh, sort of in, in what you're seeing within sort of uh, how the disability and the damned are pretty much being conflated. Um, I think a huge part of it too, and this is maybe, this is two parts and I'm trying to fit it into one, is sort of the boundary between the real and the imagined. Uh, mm -hmm. I think especially, like my background is psychology, so the real and the imagined are not as 
binary as we think they are <laughs> right and in and, and, and i think in so many ways like disgust almost becomes that sort of that that liminal resting place between the two because a lot of the real and the imagined really gets all <laughs> like just it put in a blender <laughs> with disgust because of the way that we interact because we're not even interacting with the real because the real is the imagined and the imagined is the real right and so in in your work how do you see all of these things playing itself out because and this is the last point because of the th theatricality i'm my background is also in theater so it's like ah uh, <laughs> so i'm thinking of like passion plays right and and passion plays as a pedagogical tool right and 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 so how much because i my fear a lot of the times especially in academia right is that our ideas of the of theology are are too high that we kind of forget the theology from the below, right? And it's sort of just, but it's it's the people in the pews that are, you know, like going out to vote, <laughs> that are currently, that are protesting, that are doing all of these things, right? And, and so how do you think your, your work can like, you know, just kind of uh, push this, this narrative of like this is like super i mean obviously you're already doing it but like it's so complicated and so how do you sort of like fit all of that because that's a lot <laughs> right and, and so like how does it all work <laughs> thank you uh, thank you so much so this is a great question and one that even as you're talking i'm like man even when i say in the introduction real and imagined i now re i've reified that binary right that's <laughs> Right. So I need to use words to describe what I see happening in the secondary scholarship. But the moment I use them, I now make that a, a binary that exists. Um, and the same thing happens with disability and antiquity when we talk about when you're talking about disability and disgust and these these boundaries. Right. As a disability studies scholar, I think that disability is neutral. It's not good. It's not bad. It just is. Um, and people with disabilities have positive experiences of their disability. People with disabilities have a whole bunch of shit that they have to deal with as a result of their disability. Sorry, um, but but that's that's. And so, when we go looking for disability as either a very bad thing with a capital B, or as a like wonderful, happy, skipping through the daisies experience we are likely to mess up and, and our binaries lead us astray. Um, and at the same time, I, as a scholar, have to use words to point out what I think I'm seeing in the text. So how I do it is I really try to stick as closely as possible to contemporaneous descriptions of the body. And that's why I do um, things that might seem weird to other people who work on apocalypses, which is read Hippocrates and Galen, right? Or look at the Asclepion inscriptions or, um, or some of the other material evidence from antiquity around the body, because I think that that's the closest we can come. I don't think we can ever know what it's like for a disabled person to live in antiquity, right? We're constantly reconstructing. And that's why I tried to say in my remarks too, I don't think that the disabled experience is always bad in antiquity, it's not. Um, and I've written other pieces. I have an article on First Peter um, about the redempting suffering and for, redemptive suffering, for suffering in First Peter, for example, um, and disability. I have a, a piece forthcoming in JBL on um, where I'm reading Acts 2 and the um, descent of the tongues of fire on the disciples as a holy impairment um, and their distinct speech as a, a disability that functions positively um, in that space. And um, we see this, for example, in, in Moss's article with the woman with the flow of blood. And there's also lots of non-New Testament examples of this. But I think in all of these cases, the key for me and maybe this is because I'm a historian. Um, I don't know how this works from a psychological model exactly, although I do know from MAD studies, um, right, that it's important to think of the mind body as neutral and even any of the like 
apparatus around it as potentially helpful, but also potentially harmful. Um, so I think that's where I, I would land on disgust and all of the emotions that are elicited by these images and the reality of the condition itself is that they absolutely are like real and imagined. Um, the way that we imagine it makes it that way, right? Um, and, and so, and that's how the theological piece works as well, right? When we imagine these things as powerful and productive for theological education, then that becomes so. And so what I hope that we can do going forward is learn from this and think very carefully about our theological imagination going forward. But you're right, we do have to think about how to communicate this plainly um, as well to a broad audience. And that's something I spend a lot of time thinking about in my teaching as well. <laughs> And not in a wounded shoulder prayer kind of way. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I, I think that there's, you know, there are all kinds of things that are helpful in a range of different contexts that can also then be equally harmful um, in new, in new historical moments. And I very much cling to the, the, you know, when we know better, we do better. And I myself have done some truly embarrassing theological things in my lifetime. And I, you know, that's what grace is for, man. <laughs> so, Amen to that. The Pentecostal <laughs> says, hallelujah. <laughs> Good. Thank you very much. Uh, we'll move on now to Melanie. Awesome. Josh, thank you so much for the invitation to hop on. Um, thanks to the panelists. Um, Megan, I've not met you, but thank you for what sounds like an amazing book that I have not read, but I'm now dying to. Um, so forgive me, um, some of my questions and comments here uh, might be things that you all address already in the book. Feel free to tell me, just go buy your copy and read it. Uh, that's totally fine. Um, but I think my largest question here really has to do with um, the degree to which we're talking about texts uh, that are perpetuating a kind of fantasy about the ways that bodies can or cannot be inscribed with meaning. Um, so let me kind of unpack what I mean by that. Um, so first, um, I was really happy to hear you mention um, some of these program inscriptions. I am just coming back from a trip last month to Turkey where I walked through uh, the Esclapiana program, uh, totally geeked out. Uh, but I think one of the things that caught my attention there was uh, the note that uh, likely there would have been at the entrance of the Esclapiana at this place of healing, a note that said, um, those who are about to die and those who are pregnant are not welcome here because death does not have a place here because we want to respect the gods. And so there's a way that while that is not explicitly saying that pregnant bodies are associated with death, there's certainly this implicit connection of the pregnant body with a meaning of death upon it. Um, and pregnant bodies are ascribed meaning elsewhere. Um, I was also just reading the other day uh, in Soreness's gynecology, the way that he will differentiate between kinds of pregnant bodies um, and when abortion is pregnant. And, you know, I think this came up on some of the uh, panelists' comments that um, abortion can be appropriate if it's um, affecting the mother's health, but but um, if it's in the case of hiding adultery or the woman just wants to keep her natural beauty, well, sorry, abortion um, is not okay. There's this inscription of meaning on that pregnant body. Um, Beyond that, you know, I'm thinking of um, the way that martyr bodies then are given meaning after their death. Once those bodies are no longer living, they cannot um, speak meaning into that. So, um, you know, here thinking of uh, some of Gail uh, Corrington Street's work on redeemed bodies and female martyrs. Um, and then also picking up on, uh, I think, Peter, you were the one that made this comment in your remarks about um, the way that hell houses, while depicting horror, uh, are also for an audience that still has the possibility of redemption. And so it's the sense that, yes, look, these uh, bodies uh, can have death given to them, but you yourself as the audience of this, you have the opportunity um, to choose what meaning your body has. And so there's, uh, I wonder, at least in the hell houses, and and I think my question is, uh, Megan, you know, where in the text you see something like this. Are there ways that we're getting this perpetuation of a fantasy that you, the audience of this text, the audience of this hell house, um, do have a body in which you can autonomously make decisions about the meaning that that body has, when in reality, that 
simply is a fantasy because for many, whether it's pregnant bodies or disabled bodies or enslaved bodies, all of these bodies do not actually have that kind of autonomy. And so I would be curious to hear you reflect a little bit on um, the ways that there is autonomy in inscribing bodily meaning. This is a great question, Melanie. Thank you. Um, so yes, these texts are all elite male fantasies for the most part, from what I can tell. Now we can't completely know, right? They're all apocryphal, right? And pseudonymous. I'm putting all those things in scare quotes because there's like a whole bunch of scholarship around what those terms are and how they're useful and not. Um, but but we have a lot of, we have a paucity of information about who wrote them and what context they wrote them in. That said. Given the sins they punish and the way that they're punished and the way that those sins are described and then the way that those sins change over time to fit different geographic contexts and what we think is a sin now in different contexts, I think it's very likely that there are elite male fantasies. Um, if we look at, for example, um, the hairstyles in the Apocalypse of Peter that lead men into adultery, right? Who has, who has ornate hairstyles in antiquity? Um, the, the social structure that it's trying to reinforce around making sure that elite males um, do not sleep with somebody else's matrona, right? Um, as part of that. And the inscription that you mentioned um, at the entrance to the Pergamon Asclepion, I do talk about in chapter one of the book, called Assigned to Suffering, where I'm looking at specifically, but I'm glad you brought it up because it, it specifically looks at the way in which um, Clement of Alexandria says in, uh, in one of his texts that women are assigned to suffering um, and men to the active life. And in that, that chapter, I discuss specifically this example of how at the Asclepia, a space in which the majority of our inscriptions reflect uh, women asking specifically for fertility because that is what is asked of them by their society. Um, and we have all of these like uh, votives that um, show that that's a, a common reason why you'd go to the Asclepia to ask for Asclepius's help. If you are pregnant, you can't go in. And it very clearly demonstrates the way in which the female body in antiquity is damned if she does and damned if she doesn't, especially around reproduction. Um, and we see this with the way that enslaved women are um, punished differently or would read these punishments differently if they happen to be hearing these texts and the way that they talk about breastfeeding, for example. Um, we know that ancient Christian women from our wet nursing contracts, we know that ancient Christians um, employed wet nurses with the same frequency as non-Christian women. And that um, this likely has to do with the fact that they thought that the milk would be spoiled if you're nursing and you have sex with your husband or any sexual activity spoils your milk. And, and I go into the whole ancient gynecological reasons for that. I'll not do that here, but um, but, uh, this is why a, a married woman might hire an enslaved or non-enslaved wet nurse, because in order to fulfill her obligation to her family and her husband to have as many heirs as possible, she would need, um, to continue having sex with her husband, but then she would not be able to offer pure unadulterated milk as the, um, as first Peter would suggest, um, to her children. And so um, an enslaved wet nurse might be hired. And then that would mean that the enslaved wet nurse would have to forego nursing her own children and having sex with anyone for the duration of that contract. And so when we see in the apocalyptic texts, these punishments where breast milk itself is controverted into a punishment that is exacted on female bodies in the case of the breast milk beasts, or um, when we see in the later medieval ap apocalypses, punishments for women who refused to nurse other people's children and abandoned orphans. If I'm an enslaved wet nurse and I happen to hear these punishments, 
it's very hard for me to not read that as a judgment and a condemnation of my own body and the lack of choices and agency that I have over it. And so it's simultaneously doing both of those things, right? It's, it's demanding that I read my body in a particular way, but it's also taking away any choice or agency that I might have and highlighting for me exactly where I do not stand in the hierarchy of the society. So thank you for that question. I would hate to have ended this panel without having to getting to talk about the breast milk beasts. Um, <laughs> so. Yeah, thank you very much, Melanie. And thank you, Megan, for your response. We're nearing the end of our time today. Uh, and so Megan, I'd like to give you the final word uh, if you could uh, offer your reflections. Uh, and then I have one brief announcement. I just wanna invite people to future events uh, of the reviews of the Enoch seminar. So Megan, if you have a final word. Uh, the floor is yours. I just want to say thank you again um, to the respondents and to those who, to uh, Melanie and Sid as well for participating in the discussion and to anyone who watches this later. Um, I really truly am honored by all who have read and engaged the work. Um, I, when you spend, I don't know, over five years in hell um, writing about these texts and and writing about them in this way, you, you do imagine that maybe no one will ever read this or they will think that this is just so bizarre um, <laughs> that it doesn't deserve to be engaged. And so to have this kind of engagement is beyond anything that I could ever hope or imagine. And I'm really, really, truly grateful. Thank you. Thank you. Let's give a round of applause for Megan and our uh, panelists. Thank you uh, everyone for joining today. Uh, in the chat, I'm going to drop the link for the reviews of the Enoch seminar. Uh, we have some other events coming up. The next one is scheduled for October 6, where we will be reviewing Jason Staples' work, The Idea of Israel in Second Temple Judaism, A New Theory of People, Exile, and Israelite Identity. And so we hope people will return. We regularly make announcements on the Enoch seminar Facebook page. And so uh, if you want to get more connected with the Enoch seminar, please check out uh, the Facebook group page. And so with that, I will thank you all again and bid you all a great day wherever you are in the world. Thank you for participating, everyone. Bye.